Right, I am here for another episode of Thor Inquiry. My guests for this one, guests, there's multiple. I am going to have Joshua Lisek, who I had on a past episode. You might have heard when I discussed ghostwriting. He is a best-selling ghostwriter who's written more than 80 books. I think I had him on when we were discussing his book at the time, which was so good, They Call You a Fake, which is obviously a pretty interesting topic. And we talked generally about the field of ghostwriting. And he has co-authored a new book called The Unhumans, The Secret History of Communist Revolutions and How to Crush Them. And his co-author, who's also joining us, is Jack Post subject who was a graduate from Temple in 2006 with a double major in political science and broadcast journalism. After that, he worked for the United States Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, China. So he's obviously well-versed with China. He was deployed at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base and worked for the Office of Naval Intelligence. And he also, interestingly, just if you want a piece of fun, light-hearted trivia, he also ran a Game of Thrones podcast, believe it or not. So obviously the place to start here would be why write this book? What is the genesis? Uh, well, yeah, Duncan, thanks so much for having us on. Um, you know, really exciting to to be here and talk about this. And uh, it's funny that you brought up the Game of Thrones podcast. <laughs> we've been, uh, we've been that it 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 comes up every once in a while. It was actually an anti Game of Thrones podcast. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, that well, at least it was it was anti the show from the perspective of a guy who was a super fan of the books. Oh, it, right. You know, and it. It was satirical in the sense that I did it in character. Um, okay. I was this guy called Angry GOT fan who was always like calling, like very pedantically calling out the strain, like the little differences, like you know the 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 door of the the white door on the house of the door of, of the house of black and white is actually on the right, and the left door is <laughs> okay, on the right. So you needed out on right, the left, okay. but they changed it, and right. they, they changed it in the show, which is actually <laughs> something that I looked up, and. Um, and then as as everyone knows the story that that Game of Thrones got completely, you know, and I had just started as a joke while I was on deployment actually at Guantanamo uh, in 2013. And then uh, something to do in my spare time when I wasn't in the <laughs> in the interrogation cell. And, um, you know, and then it just really took off because the show went completely off the rails. And so I, I joked that angry GOT fan won. And, um, you know, then then publicly you started getting more involved in, uh, you know, politics and just cultural commentary and you know one of the things but it's 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 interesting that you mentioned it because one of the things that i've noticed you know and that was over 10 years ago now but um that we started getting this force in western culture which was very i would say deconstructive and deconstructive through postmodernism uh, became this idea that instead of, and it, it, you you could sort of see it rear its ugly head by the end of the Game of Thrones series, uh, and then it just went, ran roughshod across, you know, Star Wars and every franchise out there, um, and then eventually made its way into politics as well, where where this this force of what what we refer to at, in in our book Unhumans is is Leninism, it is cultural Marxism. It's it's sort of the new you know Marxism was this idea that that the workers would rise up because the world is unfair and then Leninism was an addition to that where Lenin said well you need a you need a, a, a small group to be the vanguard of the revolution to then because the workers weren't raising up and, and re revolting on their own and now in the modern day it's it's this new cultural version of Marxist Leninism because there's a revolt going on but it's all cultural based so it's based around franchises but then it's also based around gender in some cases many cases you find it based around uh around ethnic issues racial issues sure. and then even religious <clears throat> issues and and for joshua and myself we make the thesis in the book that this cultural revolution which is different than say the the maoist cultural revolution of the 1960s is that it's 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 sort of irregular it's an irregular cultural revolution because you you can walk down the street in any city uh well maybe i shouldn't say city but you know any you know any town any in in the west and you know, things seem generally normal but then you know crime might go up or uh you you say the wrong thing or you wear a red colored hat in any major city in the united states and suddenly people want to to fight you and the reason for this is because it's it's all digitized and it's become a version of fifth generation warfare. And so because we find ourselves in this situation, 
Joshua and myself went back through, you know, drawing on my history, living in China and our own shared history and just fascination with these communist and leftist revolutions over the years. We put together a book to explain and systematically break down how these revolutions get started, these uprisings, how they uh, how they progress, how they become violent in many cases, almost every case, and then finally how they can be stopped, how can how they can be derailed, and eventually how they can be defeated. And it's our thesis that we're in one right now. What about for your side, Joshua? Yes. So first of all, thanks for having me on again. It's always fun to be a repeat guest on shows like yours. The hypothesis that that Jack has pointed out that we're currently experiencing a a communist revolution 2.0 in a cultural way in the western world in the anglos anglosphere we find we, we found considerable evidence for it and it was the result of our research so the book chronicles the various revolutions going back to the french revolution which was a sort of proto-communist revolution the peasant class ri rising up and overthrowing robbing and killing their their ruling classes and as we chronicled one revolution after the next in these in these outlines and in these chapters, we noticed that they all followed the same pattern. And then we then realized that we are witnessing that same pattern play out today in what would be called a low intensity conflict context, right. which is a, a terminology from warfare. And that's where nation states battle one another, not via kinetic means with, with bullets and with tanks and fighting men on, on the ground, but through subtler means, through cyber attacks, through su intentional supply chain disruptions, so on and so forth. And we could come up with myriad examples of this. Um, but the objective is for it to stay, quote unquote, in the gray zone, this strange place between there being peace between countries and there being outright kinetic conflict. In the same way that warfare has changed to be more gray zone in many situations in the world, so too has sociopolitical change, in this case, the communist revolution. And we make the case in the book that we're experiencing a low intensity revolutionary war in the Western world. And that describes how we got to this place. It predicts what's going to happen next, and it prescribes what we should do about it. Now, before communists or socialists or Marxists or Leninists or whatever they like to call themselves, Jacobins, right, any, any time period, whatever they call themselves, they engage in a period that's called operational preparation of the environment or OPE, which is another military term. What, what they do every single time is they follow a three-stage OPE process. So the first thing that they will do is they will separate the groups or the classes of a society into clear oppressors and oppressed. So to create these sort of coalitions of us versus them, haves versus have-nots. And as Jack was saying, in the past, during the industrial period, that was obviously the owners of stuff and the workers who worked on the stuff. And so you had throughout most communist revolutions, it was poor workers rising up and destroying factories, burning landlords farms, uh, dragging them out into the streets and, and, and murdering them, uh, this sort of thing. But we've transitioned to more of sort of a cultural communism now where certain races, classes, religions are deemed to be oppressors and therefore bad. And they're the oppressed who coalesce together, who join up together. And that's separation. That's what that's what happens prior to uh, a communist revolution occurring. And we've seen that over the last five decades, the last 50 years, specifically in the United States, or even, even 60 years, going back to the early 60s, we trace this process. Even into the 1950s, we, we, we saw this. Now, that's the first stage. The second stage is messaging. So after the separation, they get into the messaging. And that's where the instigators of revolution, they use mass media to manipulate the have-nots, the oppressed, the quote-unquote us, who's going to battle the them, and they brainwash them. An example of this was in prior to the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin had a simple slogan, 
peace, land, bread. Peace, land, bread. Who could disagree with that? We want to get Russia out of the war, this being World War I. We want to make sure the peasants can own their own land, own the farms that they're working on. Who could disagree with that? And then bread. The issue of, 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 of uh, agriculture and production and there being more than enough to stave off hunger. Who could disagree with peace, land, bread? Right? And so sure. now we've noticed over the last several decades, slogans that are used in the cultural Marxist context. Who could disagree with that? I th- two that I'm thinking of immediately. Love is love. Black Lives Matter. Those are both three words, sure. interestingly enough. Who could disagree with that? You're a bad person if you disagree with that, which is part of the messaging stage of a revolution. And then after that comes, and we were talking about this before we started recording, it comes infiltration. And this is where communists, progressive socialists, whatever they call themselves in a revolution, they quietly work their way into, into institutions, places of power, whether it be let's say, a legislature or a parliament or the bureaucracy who works for them and they're unelected and so they can do whatever they want because whoever is whoever loses the election next time, whoever wins doesn't matter because they keep their job regardless for the most part. Or it could be human resources departments. It could be award committees. Yes. You're infiltrated by people who are instigators, who are the vanguard that Jack was talking about. And so that's the great challenge of any historical nonfiction book is it's really boring if you don't draw parallels to the present that gives a sense of, sense of frankly, urgency to the topic. Because who cares about communism if it happened 300 years ago or 200 years ago or 100 sure. years ago? What about this then? I thought an initial place we could start before we go into the specific examples, like the broad ones you picked out there, is one thing I feel like is going to be very confusing to people is they're going to think they know mostly what these communist revolutions were about. They, of course, everyone's heard of the USSR and everyone's heard of uh, communist China and most people have heard of the French Revolution. But I'll just say from my own perspective, I'll, I'll just relate it to myself. When I was young and I heard about these topics, I have to say when I then later myself read history books about them. I was shocked. Like, this isn't even vaguely lining up. And what I realized very quickly was, oh, wait a minute. It's because, and I'll phrase it this way. As I was growing up and I was a journalist and I was wanting to become a journalist and a writer, I liked to read people like Christopher Hitchens or Noam Chomsky. And these people seemed very honest and very earnest. And they seemed to know what they were talking about. And what I actually came to realize was basically because we didn't actually have beyond, as you say, the French Revolution as a proto-communist revolution, because we never had like a full-scale USSR in like the UK or America or something like that. We don't actually really know what it looks like. And we don't know how, as you say, it manifested. It actually affected people in daily life. And so what I realized was basically the kinds of people who would want to do that kind of a revolution already had taken over universities and they were the people teaching you history and they were the people writing books about history and they were the people who got to say sort of the official word about what happened in those things. And I notice all of them in their own way, maybe not China as much, have actually been painted with incredible rose-tinted glasses. Like, it is incredible how you can get a student to think that the French Revolution, literally chopping people's heads off and just cheering and knitting while you're watching, you know, they make that sound romantic. Like, I think most people aren't even aware what even happened to Robespierre at the end of that, if you know what I mean. Like, they just think it really was this romantic, you know, like, the villagers got sick of being oppressed, they got together, yada, 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 they chopped a few heads off, but then, you know what, after that, they were free, and it was awesome, and then there was you know, the, the enlightenment and all that stuff. I get, I feel like on different levels, they've done that entirely. Similarly, when I looked into the 20th century communist stuff, I was shocked that it wasn't actually until really late in the 20th century. They're even sort of admitting to some of the crazy things that were done over there. In fact, if you ever read anything in the first 50 years of the 20th century from Western people in academia, they're actually in favor of that stuff. They're actually thinking it is like going to be the alternate method that will show the USA and the West is wrong. And actually that, you know, and even if it goes slightly wrong, hence the meme of, like they just didn't do it properly, did they? You know, they became corrupt at the end. So I would ask about that initially. If people come into this with preconceptions, they think, well, I already know about these things. And come on, you, you're reaching there. How can you make it like it's like, come on, bro, is it really communist China? Like, give me a sense of that. What would you say to that? Because I feel like if they've ever learned from a, a school, for example, in the West, I think they're already going to come in with sort of tainted preconceptions. What would you say? I'll, I'll hop on quickly. On. It, it's so important that you said that, by the way, because that's exactly the situation we address in case study by case study. We go, just as Karl Marx did, we go all the way back to the Roman Civil War, to uh, 
talk about Roman society at the end of the Roman Republic. We then go to the French Revolution. We go to the Russian Revolution, Spain, China, etc. And uh, since you mentioned France, there's a perfect example of that because, uh, and and I'll say this, you know, we just had uh, as we record this, it's the day after Easter. And one thing that people don't realize is that one of the last mass executions of the French Revolution was not a member of the royalty. It was not a part of the um, the House of Bourbon. It was not a member of, you know, it wasn't Louis or any of his, um, you know, his, in, his uh, you know, court. Um, and and even by the way, we we talk about this as well that the the idea that you should just rise up and publicly execute your leaders like this is is extremely radical. It's it's sure. not something that that countries do uh, throughout history on a regular basis. It's it's actually a, an entirely extreme act. Even if you don't like you know Marie Antoinette, she never committed a crime against anyone, um, and yet they sentence her to have her head chopped off publicly. And so you're right that it's professors who have systematically gone in and whitewashed these horrifically bloody atrocities and made them sound as if it was, you know, just sort of justified because you you needed to you needed to fight for the future. You needed to fight for progression. You need to fight for, uh, you know, they focus on the ideals, but never actually talk about the methods by which we were, were used to achieve those quote unquote ideals. And one of the things that we talk about, by the way, in the book, very specifically is that these radicals in instance after instance, whether they be communist or proto communist, as we say in France, is that many of them are not actually uh, animated or inspired by those values that they espouse, that that's all just marketing. That's all just window dressing in actuality. What they want to do is justify their own envy, justify their own anger, justify their own avarice, and then take revenge. And it is the politics of personal revenge because they feel that they should take revenge against the king and the crown, and they should take revenge against uh, the rich. And you hear, by the way, you hear this from leftists today all the time. Uh, they say, eat the rich. They say, kill all the billionaires. They say things like this constantly. And we're supposed to say, oh, it's, you know, it's just a slogan. It's just a slogan in South Africa. You know, they have songs about uh, certain thing, you know, killing certain ethnic groups. And they say, oh, it's just a traditional slogan. There's nothing, nothing to worry about. Oh, really? Sure. I mean, like R Rwanda had their traditional slogans. Um, and so going back to the French Revolution, we actually depict and we take you to the streets of Paris in the late 1700s and we put you in that square with people screaming around you as the 12 Carmelite nuns of Copignan, these religious sisters from a cloister in northern France were brought into Paris and they were publicly accused in a show trial of refusing to renounce God, refusing to renounce their vows and continuing to wear their habits as, you know, like like nuns, like re regular religious sisters. We see them all over the all over the world. And uh but the revolutionaries couldn't allow something like that to exist, even if they were just sitting off in their, you know, their abbey um, doing their thing. They brought them into Paris. They forced them to renounce their vows. The nuns refused. And then Robespierre, um, just before the end of the revolution, ordered these 12 nuns of Copignan to the the. Carmelite sisters to be publicly executed by beheading because they refused to renounce God. That's the French Revolution. And it was about 10 days after that, by the way, that the other leaders of the revolution ordered Robespierre himself to be executed. And that basically <laughs> ended the public guillotines because it had just gone too far. But you're right that professors never talk about it in these in these terms. They never tell you those stories. They never tell you stories that are a little bit too far or a little bit too hard and inconvenient to fit with yes. the narrative because it's just so horrific and so gripping. And, you know, for even for people who aren't necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic, but for even for people who aren't necessarily religious, I don't think most people would think that religious sisters are some kind of 
uh, you know, some kind of threat to the public, <laughs> you know, the same way that a, a violent criminal would be. But you look at what these people were doing. They were emptying out literally the Bastille uh, prisons and letting prisoners and violent crime, violent criminals and thugs out on the streets and the people that they were ordering for public punishment all the way up to and including capital punishment publicly were religious sisters. And what we argue is that in each of these cases, and this, by the way, attacks on the clergy, we see this happen in France. We see this happen 200 years later in Spain. We see this happen in Russia. Of course, we see this happen in China. And we're seeing it happen today with attacks on churches all across the United States, all across Canada, fire bombings, uh, targeting of priests, targeting uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral was just uh, was just, just had their Easter worship disrupted over um, some leftist protest, they burst in and were attacking, right. you know, the you know people, throwing them off the, the altar. Just just yesterday, as we record this, and so um, you know they haven't got to the guillotines yet. But but rest assured, if they um, if they are allowed to take power, it will end that way. Okay, one thing I would ask is this. I One of the areas I've noticed is a huge problem with any time you even bring up the big communist word is the if people try to split hairs on the difference between Marxism and communism and actually what Karl Marx wrote and what was in the Communist Manifesto, and I know it's almost no one's actually read Beyond the Communist Manifesto, what was in Das Kapital versus how it was done in Russia and whether what the actual practical manifestation was and, you know, would his, is there a through line between them? Is that, either you can answer this, is that, do you think, is it a red herring? Is there a clear uh, sort of channel or current of thinking between them? Is it the case that there are elements of Marxism that are just critiques of capitalism to you that aren't sinister necessarily? Did it always have to lead to the physical manifestation of, as you say, rounding people up, killing them, replacing them, changing society? There's, there's two points to, to, to cover here. So the, the, the first one is what we noticed is the, have the, the oppressor versus oppressed mental model was codified in the Communist Manifesto, it seems, first, Karl Marx. Interestingly enough, he and his contemporaries had praised the French Revolution and the right. French Revolutionary the spirit as being exemplary of class conflict and overthrow of the ruling elite. It was Karl Marx and uh, Frederick Engels, and then eventually soon, soon after you had Leon Trotsky, you had Vladimir Lenin, you had others who attempted to apply the Communist Manifesto. That said, there's not a whole lot of coherence between and among the different factions of the uprising, of the, of the revolution. But what does manifest every single time is the oppressor versus oppressed mental model. The means justify the ends. And the, the, and the Marxist vision of the creation of a utopia that can only be brought about by the elimination, the destruction the disenfranchisement, the debanking and the deplatforming of whoever the oppressor class is. And so in France or in versus oppressed designation was, was present. And in each situation where there's oppressed versus oppressor dynamic, there is a, a, a left-wing violent revolution that occurs. That is what repeats. That is the pattern that repeats where there's there's instigators, there's subversives who show up, they separate, they message, then they infiltrate, and then they allow for the incitement of actual open revolution, or what we argue for in the book we're seeing now in the United States and the Western world, micro-revolutions that target specific individuals who are of the oppressor class that they intend to neutralize. That said, Karl Marx was correct in his critique of alienation. So I had a I had a class on Marxism when I was in uh, at, at university. It was taught ironically by one of the only right-wing professors in the entire <laughs> okay. universe. The unicorn, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh it was like he was like he was like one of the only ones of the entire university who was a right-wing professor. And he's teaching the class on Marxism. And he pointed out that Karl Marx's critique of the industrialization of the West ironically destroyed the nuclear family and the extended family. And he pointed out that the elimination of the family unit 
family farms, families working together where mom or dad would be outside and mom would be inside, or maybe they'd both be outside and the kids would all be working together and the family stayed together, worked together, lived together, so on and so forth, that that was eliminated by industrial the industrialization where mom goes works in a factory dad goes and works in the mines or in a, or in the fields and then the kids go work in the factories as well uh, and are and are subjected to horrific conditions in those in those places and that was a problem that was a big problem and the professor pointed this out that marx was correct about that now just because you get the problem right doesn't mean you get the solution right. <laughs> so he goes, oh, the problem is the alienation of humanity from its own labor. Well, we should just kill everyone who owns stuff. <laughs> that, that was the proposed solution. Now, a more appropriate solution was one that was brought up by, of all people, a contemporary of Karl Marx, Charles Dickens, and other reformers, social reformers, who did in fact have a heart for the poor. They were not driven by resentment like Karl Marx and, his, and the communists were, but rather compassion. This is where charity comes from. Charity was largely a, a, a religious-based activity um, to fulfill the charge given to Christians to, to uh, serve the least of these, as the Bible says. And so there were significant reforms even in industrial Europe for protection of laborers, for uh, fewer hours. Um, in the United States, there was a man named John Patterson, who's from the same hometown that I was, who reformed the entire factory system at the turn of the century to allow for shorter work days, cleaner working conditions, sanitation, um, safety protocols and whatnot across all of his factories. And then he lectured internationally because he believed that in order to prevent a communist revolution, the haves had to take better care of the have-nots. And so uh, it is my, my my view that there were not more communist revolutions because of the John Patterson mindset, which was, we have a responsibility to take care of the least of these, whether they're able to work for us directly or, right. or, or not. So philanthropy essentially was his, Tim was like the bomb that solved it then. Yes, it, 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 exactly. It was the people who who had the power, who had the money, who had the capital, who were in a position to make things better for everyone. That was John Patterson's belief, and he spread that. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't it didn't quite reach sure. Russia in time. Well, you know, sure. you know, funny enough, you, you you mentioned that because you can. There's there's a really strong argument that the that America's response to the Industrial Revolution was superior in a sense to Europe's. Uh, because America had kind of already had its uh, political revolution prior to that. And so it wasn't this. Com so the Industrial Revolution manifests itself in Europe in World War One and World War Two, and these competing ideologies. So the you know, communism, then you have the rise of fascism as a response, uh, then these two horrific wars. Whereas in America, we sort of have this this self-correction where the Industrial Revolution happens, as you say, Joshua, and then but then instead of, you know, instead of having these massive uprisings, it's, you know, people just sort of work for better hours and people work for reform and people work to introduce some of these uh, some of these ideas. And, and you're right. A lot of it is religious driven and um, and are able to put that over. Whereas, you know, to your point, when we see in the and, and we talk about this in the book so much that they use legitimate grievances. I mean, the 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 serfs in Russia had legitimate grievances. Sure. We're not we're not saying and this is one thing that I think that, you know, the like the arch capitalists get really wrong a lot of the time. They say, well, you know, those serfs should have just been happy that they were given like really, you know, you know, they had legitimate grievances. Okay, we get it. You know, we're not talking about collective defense and, you know, we're not a feudal system anymore actually. And and that's okay. We right? we have uh we've we've come a bit of a way since then and we can make things better for all people. But the point is that if you don't attempt to do that, which by the way is to get into American politics, that's something that the populist right has been saying for a long time, by the way, that if you don't do something about the lot of the working class and working class families in America, that you are going to get someone. I talked about this with uh, when Tucker Carlson was on the show. Um, you are, I said, you're going to get like a BLM Chavez or some kind of charismatic figure like that who comes up from the far left. They don't have you know, they had like Bernie Sanders, but he was too old. And then they had AOC and she was a little bit too weird. 
um, to to be this charismatic leader. But if they were are ever able to get one, um, then America could go hard in that direction because they're using the politics of envy. Obviously, Joe Biden is not that. Although you do see the left currently using that in America today, although it's it's kind of backfiring on them with some of like the Israel Gaza stuff. Um, but this has been the issue. So you see the industrial revolution doesn't erupt in one of these, you know, socialist takeovers or communist plots that are ever able to at least openly, right. Take over U S institutions. Sure. That's why they have to go through the infiltration route because they realized it wasn't working. Uh, it realized it wasn't working publicly and we walk through this. And so this is a huge point that people need to realize is that the way that governments manage these types of things, and of course, we're going through another industrial revolution right now called the technological revolution. We're currently in a tech revolution and with sure. AI and automation and many of these things that are going on right now, you are going to start seeing the same type of material lifestyle changes and upheavals that you saw during the industrial revolution. What does this mean? This means there are gonna be people who are left behind. Of course, you saw this already with the globalization revolution. This is why in the United States and many parts of Europe, uh, the working class, the for the, this former manufacturing base was completely gutted and destroyed. Um, and this led to strains on our our shipping and our supply chains. And of course, I you know I, I live not too far from that bridge that got uh, that oh, got right. destroyed last week. Um, you know that's a bridge I used to take my family over all the time. At least at least once a month we would be on that bridge. And you know it, this is this book on humans. It gives you a lens through which to examine all the things that were going on using the lens of history, but applying it to things that are going on today to say to to talk through many of these these uh phenomena that, and, and these forces that are ripping through culture ripping through society ripping through the economy and explain that this has been seen before these types of upheavals some countries have dealt with it well other countries not so much and these are the results when it goes the wrong way one thing I thought would be an interesting way to tackle the uh, USSR, the Soviet revolution, is the angle that I remember hearing once Jordan Peterson say that if you ever have a like tyrannical a dictatorship, something like a, a political vanguard from communism who rule over with the commissars and stuff, it's very easy for people to excuse everyone else in the society's behavior later and go, what could they do? You know, they had guns and they were telling you what to do. And that do it doesn't work that way. I mean, anyone who's seen that film a bug's life that children's film knows that the premise is you have to consent you have to go along with it you have to give your energy and your power to it and ultimately you have to believe the lie and you have to repeat the lie to be a citizen of these cultures and so a thing I wanted to ask was I feel like a lot of people again in the West the way they've done it is they either in the academic sphere make it like like they try with the the um the revolution in France, they make it sound like it is just farmers doing all this and they just got together a local farmers meeting and they went to the big city with the pitchforks. Like they don't even know, for example, like obviously moneyed interests were in the French Revolution. Obviously, if you look at some of the people who were directly funded by Germany and the West who went into Russia to do these things, people like Lenin, etc. And they had all these things. It wasn't just like top down, even at the end or at the beginning. And it was never only bottom up. But the most interesting part I'm trying to get to is, to me, when I've read things like the Gulag Archipelago, the most shocking thing you realize is even those revolutions are just about personal resentment. And what they do is they, they are able to mine the personal resentment of your neighbor as to why him killing you is like a political act or is some sort of a like an idealistic utopian dream that essentially if he can just get rid of you and let's like the Salem witch Charles, maybe he just didn't like you anyway and he wanted to get rid of you for whatever reason, you know, whatever reason it could be. Maybe you have a, bit, a nicer house than him or you have a you know, slightly better car or you have a dog that doesn't bark all the time. Whatever it is, you sort of like mine that resentment, you radicalize the individual and then essentially they become your sort of like ground troop, as it were. They become a shock troop for you and it's, and it's not only the people come with a load of guns and point at everyone and it's not only that people organically rise up and say we have freedom break off your chains there's there's an element of what i hope people can see the parallel that you're seeing in the west now this is what grievance politics is right that's right it's a it's oppressor versus oppressed dynamic and it's a new it's a new morality it's a it's a it's a replacement for right versus wrong uh and 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 the rule of law um and this is why we call these forces 
unhumanity. Also, we call them anti-civilization because to be to be human in our civilization is to have inherently human rights to life, liberty, and property, and no one can take those from you. And so what unhumans do, the subversives, the instigators, and the radicals, they foment mobs and they rep- and they supplant human rights with the unhuman rights of the oppressed to rob and kill those they deem their oppressors, whether they are actual oppressors or not. And that becomes the new morality. And they, and they build an anti-civilization that cannibalizes itself. One of the ways to defeat a left-wing government is let it destroy itself <laughs> because it's like it's like the Ouroboros symbol of the snake eating itself, devouring its own tail. That is every left radical left-wing um, government, political movement, because what they do wherever they manifest is they rob and they kill once they attain total power. And once their enemies are gone, they simply turn on each other. And this happens, of course, that's happened to Robespierre, but it happened in the Spanish Civil War with certain communist uh, m- uh, militias were 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 uh, were arrested and executed for being the wrong kind of communist, even though they were fighting the the uh, uh, the, the 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 common enemy. It's because they just ran out. <laughs> they they ran out of enemies in their immediate proximity, and they began turning their guns on each other. Lenin did the same thing with the with the Bolsheviks um, driving out the Mensheviks, who were who were a less radical version sure. of of uh, communist uh, socialists. We see this later with with Stalin, where Joseph Stalin demanded the the purging of everyone who had promoted him, who had been a champion of him, uh, because they were the wrong kind of communist, and therefore they were a threat to uh, his hold on the country. So it's a it's a dark comedy of errors when communist revolutions succeed, is they ultimately end up. Uh, destroying themselves for that very reason. But it's because of that mental model, that paradigm, that worldview of oppressor versus oppressed. And we are deeply concerned now that we see that reemerging when, as, um, as, as Jack was saying, when there are radical revolutionaries who want he want more than equality they want equity which in their case is robbing and killing those who look like the people who robbed and killed their ancestors that's the situation in in south africa currently i have several south african clients that they can speak to this reality unfortunately it happened during the haitian revolution when anyone who was white was deemed an enemy of the state they had their property confiscated, and a genocide was committed against them, completely wiped out uh, anyone who was European or a descendant of, of Europeans. And eventually, the revolutionaries started turning on each other and then subjected their own people to slavery. So in the history books, the Haitian Revolution is seen as this wonderful slave revolt that brought freedom and equality to it, uh, to the country. But what they left out is that slavery had been outlawed prior to the revolution to prevent revolution. But yet you had the instigators pushing and pushing and pushing, saying, no, we have to correct historical injustices. We have to get equity, not equality. We have to get we have to get revenge. We have to make them suffer. And the result after they succeeded was the reinstitution of slavery sure. of their own people. It was ridiculous. By the way, uh, this will sound like a strange initial opening question, but Jack, obviously your wife is a, poli- a public figure herself. I just wanted to know, can you tell me what her age is, if that isn't a secret or rough ballpark? Uh, so she was born in the late 80s. So uh, basically, I put it this way. She was born to just catch the tail end right. of the Soviet Union. Uh, she has a Soviet birth certificate. And uh, although her younger sister was actually born in the Republic of Belarus. Right. So I, I always make this joke about my uh, my wife's family that uh, her grandparents were born in Poland. She was born in the Soviet Union. Her sister was born in Belarus. They're all from the same, the same town. Place. Yeah, they, well, They're all from the same okay. town. Yeah. I was going to ask, look, is it just the he's, she's sort of from that? She's sort of from that 
uh, that region of Belarus that so it borders directly with yes. Poland, at least currently borders directly with Poland, although there's been a little little bit of history over yes. there, the history. And for so, you know, you, you talk to her about these kind of issues and this stuff. Uh, let's just say it's not exactly theoretic. It's not academic. You know, it's it's, you know, you're talking to her grandmother and she'll tell you the story. And her grandma is still around in her 90, in her in her 90s. And she'll tell you the story of what it was like the day the Germans came to town. Right. That's what I was going to ask was, is that coincidental? Is this something that also spurred your interest in that specific as aspect of communism? Did you have any influence from her? Uh, well, certainly, um, certainly I've, I've heard a lot of stories from her uh, talking to the extended, you know, her and her family, the extended family about that history, not only of living through the war, but also living through the Soviet Union and, um, it really talking to Tanya about it is that what she remembers. So people need to understand this, that when we talk about in the book, how there's different ways to sort of come to the end of a communist revolution. One of which um, essentially is you just wait it out. And the Soviet union is a great example of waiting it out. So it took about 80 years for them to finally uh completely be liquidated of the wealth they looted from the imperial russian treasury and then you know promptly tried to foment revolutions all around the world successful in china and a few areas in asia though you know vietnam but although not so much in europe and you know they run out of money and then your government collapses so what her earliest memories are at least you know outside of you know family and stuff are growing up in a country that's experiencing a complete and total state of collapse. And that's a country where all of a sudden people are questioning, how can you have law enforcement if there's no government to pay them? How can you have firefighters? How can you have uh, an economy without anyone maintaining anything? How do you have courts? How do you have contracts if there's no laws because uh, there's no judges to, to oversee all of this? I don't think anybody who hasn't lived through that. And even myself who, um, you know, just, just knowing her and then, and then knowing the rest of her family, it's, it, it only gives you a small glimpse into just how hard that is to go through living through a, a government and a country that's in a complete state of collapse. Now things obviously have stabilized to an extent over there, though, of course, we're certainly seeing, um, much conflict with, uh, between you, Europe, sure. NATO, and uh, and sort of the the Russian speaking world, but it's you know, and it's always been in a in a state of conflict. But it's it's pretty horrific, and uh, you don't know how you're going to feed your family. And she's she's told stories about her own father having to uh, go through some harrowing ends just to be able to get you know a can of peaches for his daughters, and and people need to realize that when they go along with these romantic visions and and really leftist politics is born out of romanticism then you know, think of it think of the things they claim right they can make the world uh perfect and it's sure. all it's a utopian vision and ever no one will want for anything and it's it's go you don't even need a government actually because everyone will be doing things out of the goodness of their heart which is you know a really interesting take on human nature and um, it's, it just never works. And of course, our argument throughout the book is that the people who are actually behind these things know that it's not going to work. And of course, you'll, you'll hear this question every once in a while is that how can people still support communism and adopt Leninist tactics when they know that it's led to the deaths of a hundred million people? And of course, our argument is that deep down, because they're motivated by grievance politics, they view those hundred million deaths as a good start and they'll say you know what those were people who stood in the way of utopia they stood in the way of us us reaching our final destination and as such they chose to be uh you know to they chose to be dying in the mass graves along with one another and so you know we look at the upheavals that went through and it's it's pretty horrific so you know even though i've had this sort of um you know, a lot of history in my own personal life with communism. Uh, obviously, my family's Polish, so, you know, I've got a lot of stories there as well sure. that, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I'd, I'd like to say that it was all a plan, but if it was a plan, it was, uh, you know, someone, um, you know, somebody, somebody up in the sky was was sort of pushing me in that direction. Maybe. Okay. 
By the way, on the topic of the Chinese Communist Revolution, I actually feel like it's actually absurd how little is known about this in the West. Like, here's a funny thing everyone will have seen recently, because obviously the three body problem is something everyone's hopping on as the next big trend as a TV show. Everyone's kind of shocked at those scenes in it that just show like the youth revolution, basically, and how they were like being horrible to all the older people and anyone older than them and, and humiliating people in public and doing all terrible things. And when I was watching this, I remember thinking, wait a minute. It. I must have watched, I mean, I'm a film fan. I must have watched a hundred films about World War II. I've watched so many films about the Nazis, about conflicts in France and even in the Pacific. And, I, and then I tried Googling. I just thought movies about communist Chinese revolution. The, the joke is it only suggests about eight you know, normally that page where it's, if you put in movie, feel good movies, it's going to put like hundreds of options. You'll see all the, all the all the covers of them. And by the way, the eight it shows, none of them look like a Hollywood production. Nothing's a massive thing. I think this speaks to what I was saying earlier about how like at a certain point in time, people didn't want to villainize China. And that was, I actually think most people in the West don't know what the communist revolution is. They actually, I mean, obviously it's very confusing to them now because they hear that the CCCP runs China, but then does that mean it's still communist? Now, how would you unpack some of that stuff? Like, what was the the gist of it? What why do, why do you think it? And people in the West just don't know about it. And has the things in the modern day, some of the capitalist commerce with China, some of the way it's now being portrayed as maybe not it's a hybrid economy or whatever they say now. Is it the case that it's not actually still communist? What what would you how would you unpack some of that? Oh wow! So yeah, there's a lot of uh, sure, there's a sure. lot there. So yeah, obviously 100 percent right that um, we've never seen any Hollywood depiction of any of Chinese communism up until the the opening scenes of the three body problem. And although I haven't actually watched the series myself, funny enough, you mentioned that because we started off talking about the Game of Thrones TV show. Um, three body problem is made by the same showrunners who did oh, the Game of Thrones okay. TV show. So David Benioff <laughs> okay. and D.B. Weiss. And I'm actually told that um, that uh, the show actually does become pretty woke after that point. But um, that seems so incredible, in, but okay. <laughs> in the, in the Chinese version of the show, now Three Body Problem is a huge uh, national phenomenon in China. It was one of the first Chinese novels to get translated to English. Uh, oh, excuse me, sci-fi novels turn, translated into English, and then it won the Hugo Award. Did very well. Um, it's very it's it, astro. It's it's an ast describes an astrophysical um you know issue. This three bodies in in orbit with each other, basically, and. Um, and so in the Chinese version, there's a reference to this scene uh, because it it has something to do with uh, what later comes up in, in, as a plot point because the daughter becomes the main character. Right. Although so the the cultural revolution is mentioned, it's sort of referenced in the Chinese version, but in the American version, they've actually gone and depicted it. So, it, uh, you know, slight credit to to the guys who were the uh, the uh, the my nemesis okay. in the uh, in my previous okay. podcast on that one. But but we'll see how the rest of the show goes. I'm not holding out hope. And uh, just because of prior prior history. But you're right that we have a as the West, we will go through and tell stories about the the paintings that were saved by the special units th across Europe in World War II. And we will tell stories about endless, endless stories about World War II, just endless every year. Every time you go and look at the crop of movies that are being produced, there's always, you know, 10 to 12 percent that are about World War II, it seems. And now yes. World War One is starting to get a little bit more attention uh, because World War II became so oversaturated. However, when you ask about any of the things that we just mentioned, whether it be uh, the Chinese Chinese Revolution or the Chinese Cultural Revolution, because when you asked about that specifically, it's it's actually a misnomer because the Chinese Cultural Revolution was actually the second communist revolution in China. There were two. So the first Chinese Revolution was when Mao came to power, and this ends in on October first, nineteen forty nine when he ascends Tiananmen Square and becomes the leader of China. Uh, but then because uh, full-on communism got so many people killed due to starvation, Mao was about to lose power by the end of the 1950s. And then so when the 1960s rolled around, Mao launches another national revolution within his first revolution so that he can keep power where, uh, and this is where you see the purges come in. He goes to the youth as you correctly show uh, state and they show in this film or uh, I guess it's a series 
that uh, that he then goes to the masses and says these communists and they're actually secret right wing extremists. That's actually the phrase that's printed on right. on the on the placards underneath the victims of these public struggle right. sessions. They're they're all charged with a you know with a, with their crime, their crime against the revolution, and they're the anti revolutionary crime that many of them are charged with, not the only one, but many of them. Some people are cap, you know, capitalist rotors. Some people were uh, wealthy peasants, um, which is kind of what you would, what we would refer to today as a small business owner, like a wealthy peasant. Like you're not right. aristocracy, but you're, you know, you've got some money. So you're like a small business owner. Or maybe you've got like a couple houses up for Airbnb, that kind of thing. And um, the one that we, that was depicted most frequently and is depicted in the film, it says, right wing extremist, that you're a right wing extremist. So using the same phraseology that we hear today, uh, for example, if you look at my Wikipedia page, right? Um, sure. <laughs> really written by communists. And it's it's the exact same phrases again and again. Now, the question of whether or not China is communist still today, well, it's it's basically like this. Does China have equality? No. Did China ever actually reach equality after now um, what, something like 70 years of communism? No, of course they never reached equality. But what did they do? They killed a lot of small business owners. They killed a lot of religious people. They killed a lot of people that were close to uh, the old uh, the old regime. And they, kill, they certainly killed a whole lot of nationalists. And what they did after Mao's death in 1976 was by 1978 when Deng Xiaoping ascends to the leadership of the party. He never actually had a title as the chairman of the party, um, although he sort of was unofficially, as everyone knows, the supreme leader. Um, he then introduced foreign direct investment. He opened up China to the West. And this is where we get our new form of globalism, because China essentially, after 1978, becomes the factory for the rest of the world. And this is the situation we're in now. So anyone who was working in a factory, working in trades, manufacturing, this type of thing, got completely undercut by Deng Xiaoping using the slave labor of China and the elites all across the West saying, hey, we can make a lot more money if we just have these Chinese slaves uh, produce everything for us. So that's where China is now. And it's it's an interesting case, I guess I would say, is they're communist in the sense that the party controls everything, but they're not communist in the sense that they they're ab you know, they're not doctrinaire communists in that they're not interested in um, preventing people from making money. In fact, they're hyper capitalist in many sure. ways. They have destruction of the family units. And so I, I would argue that they are communist in a historical sense because this is what you always get. You have a party that's in total control. And then if you want to uh, be successful in China, if you want to go far in, let's say you're in the military, you want a military career, if you're in business or social media or acting and uh, Chinese movies are starting to uh, be exported more, I think this, this three-body problem is actually a sort of hybrid of uh, the past versus today um, of, of Chinese American. And you you must become a member of the party. And so the party um, introduces themselves to you. They come to you with a recruitment kit and they essentially say, hey, we think you're um, you're doing very well in your your military studies or in your uh, your career here. Your company looks like it's taking off. Here's your recruitment package. And as as you know, just like when the mafia comes to you with an invitation, uh, sure. there's only one answer yes. to that question. There's only one answer. And, um, you know, if you if you think, by the way, that that offer cannot be rescinded, go ask Jack Ma. So Jack Ma was kind of the. Uh, like I guess the Elon, the Elon Musk, of China, Musk yeah, of China. Sure. Yeah, I, I, probably yeah. the closest thing you'd have to say to it. Uh, he was, I think, the second richest man in the world at one point, something like this. Or um, he, was, he was very high up, one of one of the richest people sure. in the world. And he attempted to get into the banking sector. And this was he was going to start introducing these micro banks all over China. But the the financial wizards of the party, he, he basically hadn't gotten the blessing of the party for this and started introducing it through Alibaba was the the system he made. This was this was the place where companies throughout the West could go to uh, the slave labor of China and then determine what widget they wanted. And Alibaba was the place where you could do that. And they publicly disappeared him. And for a period of four months. Uh, at the end of 2020, so at the height of the pandemic, um, in the midst of the U.S. 
election, this is why so many people haven't haven't heard about this. They publicly disappeared him and cracked down on all of his businesses and canceled these IPOs and these these micro banks that he was going to be doing and basically told basically laid down the law. And uh, he was in exile at one point. I think he ended, I think he popped up in um, in Spain at once. And then he was in uh, then he was in Tokyo for a little bit. And I, I believe that he didn't even return to China until about 2023. So they threw him into exile. They took over his businesses and they basically showed the world that just like when Mao was in charge, if uh, if you threatened leadership or if you stepped out a little bit too far, that it doesn't matter who you are, they are going to crack down on you. And this, by the way, is something that Xi Jinping has not to get too into it. Uh, I touch on it on my podcast, but um, there's there's so much we could get into. And I, this book could be, you know, 5000 pages long if we wanted to. But sure. uh, Xi, Xi Jinping specifically has made this a a hallmark of his premiership in China um, by going after high profile, what he views as potential rivals for power within China. And actually, you, you know, we started talking about TV shows. The number one show in China right now is this sort of reality TV series where um, public officials who have been critical of Xi Jinping are uh, public make public apologies to him, go on televised struggle sessions, which are really no different than the struggle session depicted in Three Body Problem. They admit that they were corrupt. They admit that they had personal moral corruption. They always talk about this in China, moral corruption, that they have failed the Chinese people and uh, that they will accept their punishment. And their punishment, you know, usually comes with either exile or imprisonment. Uh, it's always through the destruction of character, the assassination of character and exile from public life. Uh, I believe they've done three series now, three seasons. And uh, it's currently the number one TV show in China. So the struggle sessions have not ended. They've only taken on a new media form. To ask a little bit, as you said, Joshua, it's obviously best to relate this to people's life and what they see around them today or in society. So one thing I would ask is, if people were to look at the kinds of people that we would describe as being in this potential revolutionary vanguard or the people who are the infiltrators and sowing the seeds, I think the most genius thing that appears to have been done in the West is, as I said, people haven't ever lived through a communist revolution by and large, unless they're in a very unusual position like Jack's family. And so they tend to think, right, well, I'll know what happens if people come with guns or a giant red flag or, you know, that we have exactly these things, but they don't seem to realize some of these things already happen. But I, I would explain this way. I think the interesting thing from my perspective is they really have taken the people that seem the least threatening initially. Like they actually do just seem like the person who like, oh, right, this is a woman trying to break into a man's world. So of course, you know, you, you, don't, you don't, you root for her. Of course she has grievances against this. They'll take someone who they have a, a sexuality that's not traditional, let's say, for example. And so maybe in the past, they would have been vilified for that. And then that person, you think again, oh, well, I understand why they'd be sort of angry or they'd have like a, they'd want to deconstruct what currently is to, you know, to maintain their own identity. They do this across the field. I mean, the joke in the modern days, when I grew up in England, Jack, the kind of person who would be the loveliest person in my town would be if I went into a library, the old woman who worked there and stamped the books. Right? I would never, ever imagine... She she would be part of like a communist revolution that would destroy my town and kill me all and have us all hung in the town square. But if I go into a library today, the kind of person who's going to check the books out literally probably is actually like if I could see their Twitter, it would have all the it would have all the words. In it, you know what I mean? Like they've actually gotten almost to the soft underbelly. And so I feel like the barbarians were in, are within the gates to some degree, but people don't even know. They, they kind of still think that they're going to see an invading force in a way. What would you say to that? Yes, that's very right, that the normal person in England, Scotland, Canada, America, you know, and, and the Western world seems to have no understanding of the time and season of of the sociopolitical revolution that has already been taking place for, for decades. And this goes to show how effective the operational preparation of the environment has been, the environment being all the terrains of society. That is economy, that is government, that is education, media, and so on. And the institutions that have been captured by the instigators of this low-intensity revolutionary war conflict that we're experiencing 
And like Jack was saying, if you look out in the streets in, in, in many major cities and even small towns, townships all around the Western world, both the Western and Eastern Hemisphere, you don't see a mob of factory workers on strike waving a sure. red flag and some uh, key figurehead with a suit and tie waving his fist at uh, up at, up in the sky and demanding we're going to, going to charge such and such government building and we're going to overthrow the government. That's that's not what we see. That's what was seen in the past. That was Mao. That was Lenin. That was Robespierre. That was other other figures. You know that that was the Haitian Revolution. Uh, that was the Khmer Rouge, for example, in Cambodia and in other places. It was you know it was Che. It was Castro. But. In the same way that warfare has changed to further the political ends of a national government, so too has revolutionary warfare changed. And so now what we see, and we introduce this in the book, the concept of micro-revolutions, where instead of targeting everyone in a class of people, the revolutionaries are targeting key individuals and organizations for debanking, for doxing, for deplatforming, and the objective is to inflict terror upon them as a sort of revenge. Remember, it's not about equality, it's about equity. People like me had it bad in the past, so you should have it bad in the present. Sure. And it's our job to create that. It's only fair. That's the language that's now being used. It's even in the DEI, equity, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a is a popular keyword that's used in corporate America, in and not just America, but elsewhere in the in the Western world. Um, if there there are jobs being posted that say, if you're a specific race, you need not apply. We will not consider you. That demonstrates operational preparation of the environment was successful. The key institutions have uh, already fallen to the revolutionaries, but it was done in a, in a quiet, low-intensity revolution so that uh, the cultural Marxists have, in effect, won without fighting, which, ironically, is, a, and is an ancient Chinese warfare doctrine of Sun Tzu and the art of war, winning without fighting. Right. right. I thought what we'd do is the first part we'd do with the two of you, and then Jack can hop off and we'll do some discussion about something. So I actually have one last question for you, Jack, and I'm going to bookend it thematically here, which is... Let's do it. You can pick. You can do both or one. So USSR, Chinese Communist Party, if they were within the Game of Thrones universe, a song of ice and fire, what house or faction or type of peoples <laughs> would they be? <laughs> oh, man. Of course... Um... You know, you put me on the hot seat because I, I'm way too nerdy to uh, to throw that out there. I would say so. the The Bolsheviks, you know, that's got to be House Bolton, okay? Because they they were just particularly ruthless, uh, particularly horrific. Um, then the Chinese communists, hmm, they've got it's it's sort of like. They're they're kind of like the Targaryens, but with the Dothraki, uh, the Dothraki hordes along with them. So the Targaryens, okay. in the sense that they want to kill everyone and destroy everything, but then they've got the Dothraki hordes as well. And they don't care how many people they burn in the cities. But then the Dothraki, because of course they've just got these massive hordes of people that they can call. And this is of course how China wins the war against the nationalists. So yeah, they'd be the uh, they'd be the Dothraki. Yeah. Well, right, the Targaryens plus the Dothraki. Sure. All right. Thanks for your time, Jack. Appreciate it. Take care, guys. See you, Jack. Right. They'll take a slight different turn in tone now, guys, because we're going to talk not about this book now. There's some other things I want to talk about. So one thing I actually found quite interesting, Joshua, is a lot of people might be interested to know that one of the main people at the moment that you've been collaborating with is um, Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, who as someone actually, I have to say completely separately, but I wasn't aware before that you actually were collaborating, is someone, I, he's someone actually where, unironically, I know you guys hear this all the time, but I actually have literally bought his books as gifts for other people about, certain, let's again, I don't have to say the names, but certain topics, especially some of his about, let's say six or eight years ago, if you know what I mean. So certain books like that, because when I read them, I think the most amazing quality I have to say about his writing is, 
It's why it doesn't surprise me the newest book is like reframe your brain. That's exactly what it seems to do to my brain on any topic. It's like I'll go in with the preconceptions and then I expect, right, he's just going to give me his opinion. So it's like, right, buckle in. Let's see what his opinion is. And then, you know, like any author, you see if you vibe with it, you see if there's an in point, you know. And what I realized is he was never doing that. He was actually always sort of saying like, I'm choosing, I just say he's basically someone who uses models. You know, he's using, I'm using this model in this particular way. And also he seems to tie it quite interestingly. This is why it becomes almost philosophy all like life advice. He'll take concepts, might be political, might be about work, might be about society, but he also seems to tie it to a notion, which I think is a very healthy one, which people don't examine, which is when you undertake an ideology or a reframing, or you look at a particular model, people don't do the obvious thing they do when they buy a product, which is, do I actually want the outcome of this? Like, do I want what my life will become if I believe this, or if I choose to go down this path, or if I adopt this particular thing? And I notice he has a very healthy sort of attitude to the idea that you're always trying to like improve your life and improve your understanding and, and even actually one thing I would say his books are amazing for that's why I give them his gifts is I think they can provide a window into why a loved one or a friend of yours thinks a certain thing without you having to think that thing. Actually, it can sort of explain, it gets past sort of the cultural engineering that gets between the two of you and does actually, this ties before, I guess, divide and conquer and make you think, well, they believe that or they're not the person I thought they were. And then you might realize what well, maybe they're seeing a different side of something or maybe they're vibing with a different element of that ideology. What would you say? You've, you've started to work with them. Obviously, this book is on that topic itself. It's actually explicitly about some of these things. What would you say along any of these areas? I, I do sort of a potpourri approach. You just pick what you want from it. Yes, yes. Reframe Your Brain was a fantastic book to work on with Scott because it reframed my own brain, of course, working on this right. working on this book. So one of the uh, hypotheses presented is that everyone has frames from which they operate. A frame is a worldview. It's your assumptions about reality. It's the place from which and through which you think of a topic that you experience in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's work or it's your fitness or it's relationships. We all have assumptions about what's doable for us, what's possible, what our goals are or ought to be, even everyday frustrations and challenges that we go through that we can't seem to find a solution for. And so the book offers more than 160 reframes, which are new perspectives on these topics, which can be challenging or even frankly uh, annoying if we have to deal with them over and over and are kind of stuck in a perpetual problem. And these new reframes offer a better way to think of it and therefore a better way to operate. And it's, it's a way of replacing an impoverished reality with one of possibilities. Okay. What I would actually also ask, and it's a rare opportunity where I can I can get sort of inside what it's like to be in Scott's sphere, but not from him. Because one thing I think he does an amazing job, by the way, as you can tell he's a world-class hypnotist, is he directly communicates with his audience and he presents a lot of his ideas himself. And he's very, very eloquent and he knows how to phrase things. He has a really great turn of phrase, I've noticed, is... What is, can you give me some sense of what it was like to meet this individual? Like, did you yourself have thoughts of what he was like or what he was going to be like? Or was there any sort of like unusual, there any surprising aspects to working with him that you, you wouldn't have anticipated perhaps or were just pleasantly, delightfully surprising? Working with Scott compared to working with a lot of public figures, Scott is one of those rare people who is the same person in public as he is in private. If you watch him on his live stream, and how he is in the live stream. Imagine you're opening up a Zoom call with him, or you're having a phone conversation with him. It's, it's the same person that you're talking to. With innumerable other public figures I have written for and worked with and collaborated with over the years, particularly the most high profile ones, they're worlds apart. When the public figure, this is most public figures, when the camera is on and their makeup is on, and the smile is on. When the lights go off, the camera goes off. The smile collapses. They wipe off the makeup as fast as they can, and they go back to being who they really are. Right. And often, that is not a person any of us would want to trade places with. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're, they're often surrounded by obligations, anxieties, dysfunctional relationships 
debts and their personality is not as charming as the one they present. And by the way, what also I've noticed with, with many public figures, particularly those who purport to be super progressive, calling back to the early part of our conversation, in private, they are not at all. They may not at all right. even agree with what they're saying. You know, the, the woke talking points, for example, that they say when the lights are on, they may not believe any of that, but they're so pragmatic or perhaps cynical that they will say whatever gets them paid. And if you were to ask them, as I have, so when you said this in this interview, what did you mean by that? Does that mean that you want to communicate this in the book? And like, what are you talking about? I don't believe that at all. I don't want to say that. And like, uh, you said that this this video in which you said that has 5 million views. <laughs> okay. You know that, right? Well, that was just a script that somebody wrote for me to say and paid me. Oh, okay. And then you see that over and over and over again. Many public figures, particularly those who are in the mainstream, are difficult to ghostwrite for because they're vacuous. Meaning they're they're hollowed out of their own worldview because they will say that which gets them paid the most. They will align their public perspective with the institution that they want to cater to. So for example, if there's a university they want to speak at in the or or there's a, a talk that they want to give or there's a book deal they want to give, they will in the months and even year plus leading up to that opportunity that they know they're going to get, they will say things that align with the viewpoint of that institution. To, right. to, to, to make it to, to kind of uh, uh, soften up the ask when they ask for it. It looks like they fit and they're perfect. And it's it's a rather cynical way of of doing business and a way of uh, a way of living because you're effectively lying to everyone all the time about everything. And we're not exactly sure who the person is. And then the person that you do talk to behind the scenes, it's difficult to ghostwrite for them because they don't have any original thoughts because they're just saying what they're being paid to say, whoever's saying the most. They're perpetually for sale. So difficult to ghostwrite for. And I lament this with the with the, uh, with the client that I name Misty inside of my, my other book, So Good They Call You a Fake, that innumerable times I have had to make up from scratch an entire book, an entire system, a methodology, a how-to step-by-step process for some of these public figures because they have no advice. They've just been told by their agent or by, uh, let's say, someone, their mentor, you need a book because famous people like you have a book, so you need a book. And they just hire a ghostwriter and then they let the ghostwriter do all the heavy intellectual lifting. They don't have any original thoughts. This gets awkward, though, when the client re uh, is interviewed about the book that they haven't even read that has their name <laughs> on it okay. because they give answers that are diametrically opposed to what's in the book. Um <laughs> <laughs> and those interviews always go a little bit, a little bit fun. So I, I, uh, I tend not to work with public figures like that anymore. Those who are in the mainstream, because they tend to be vacuous. They don't read their own books, and uh, it's difficult to parse out from them what they actually believe because they've been paid to believe so many different things and say so many different things. It's hard for them even to determine what they are anymore. Uh, and so people like people like Scott who are free thinkers who think in public and have that rapport with his audience. He live streams twice a day, having con and has for years now, uh, having conversation, getting feedback back and forth. He has an honesty to him and a, and a pragmatism that is not combined with a cynicism or a narcissism like I see in a lot of public figures. It also seems like over the years from reading his books and hearing some of his interviews, he's someone who seems to do, this is something I relate to a lot, is he can simultaneously have like a prescriptive thing of like, you could do this tactic in society or you could do this in your life, this specific thing. But then he also will totally admit like, what his kind of principle in that case is. Well, I want, you know, I, like a classic example would be, even though he would be painted as some sort of conservative figure at this point in time, just because of the nature of culture, I notice he's someone who always stresses, actually, he does believe in, for example, like social programs and things like that. And the idea of like, again, like the idea of, I mean, I think he even had a very edgy way of like framing the idea to that you should have reparations essentially for black people in America. Like obviously not a thought that a lot of right wing people want to hear or conservatives want to hear, but he had a very, he had his own angle on it. And so I, I think, I feel like that must have been interesting in the writing process, right? Is like, it, you're not just writing ideas or you're not just writing like what you can do in a way it must be embodying some of his philosophy. 
Yes. So Scott's philosophy, his his foundational philosophy is in the phrase systems over goals. That, of course, was in the original how to fail at almost everything and still win big. And that went on to its second edition. And it's the most influential personal development book of all time. Because since then, in the decade plus since then, the vast majority of bestsellers, including the ones that have sold 10, 15, 20 million copies, are laundering his ideas, but using the, right. the new author's own terms and examples and, and descriptions. Uh, so it, it, so the self-help industry is effectively the poor man's Scott Adams uh, at this point. Now, the systems over goals concept allows for freedom of options because you don't necessarily have to say, well, what will this political party accept? Or what's going to work for this institution or for that organization? Or what's going to be couth with this interest group or that interest group? Systems over goals sets what's going to work. And then how do we do that continuously so that it has a higher likelihood of working rather than have a, a vague social goal like eliminate poverty? And then a bunch of, well, what, what, what do we, what, how do we do that? Well, throw money at it. <laughs> Give people money, I guess. And of course, that doesn't work because it's it's a goal, not a system. A system understands that there are multiple moving parts. There is in almost innumerable components. And reality is not black or white, but it's probability. What's more probable to work and what's less probable to work? Like he said in an interview just a couple of days ago, he said that roughly 60% of success in life is found in not going to prison, not becoming a drug addict, and having some type of marketable skill, at least just one. It's sure. just one skill. That's 60% of success in life. And, he, and the honorable mention he threw in was having um, basic manners. So no prison, no, you know, no crime, no drugs, one marketable skill, and basic manners. That's 60% of success in life. Now, Teaching those four paths, I guess they're both, both things to do and things not to do, is a solution that is doable for the masses. So it's a practical solution. It's it's a doable solution. Um, and, and that's how Scott thinks. And so working with someone like Scott is thinking the thoughts of a reasonable person after him and then wondering, is there a better way or a more succinct way or a more persuasive way to say this, to demonstrate or to illustrate this? Uh, and that was my job. One thing I actually think I would like to stress about this book and the concepts in it, I noticed in some of the interviews, actually, he essentially says this himself, which is, I don't really see what downside anyone could have to attempting this. Like, even though the, the concept of like reframe your brain sort of might sound like something radical. In fact, I, leave, I often even do use an analogy myself to tell people not to go down certain rabbit holes if they don't know about like conspiracy things, for example, because if you go from your original worldview and you don't alter it and then you just dig into this really dark topic at the end you might get black pilled you might feel like everything's doom and gloom and and how can we all live and i can all go and so i would say in that scenario my analogy there is if you go too deep into some of those topics it's like if your brain was a computer you just you didn't use the operating system you started hacking the bios and doing all crazy things and writing your own but you're not a programmer yet you don't know you don't really know what you're doing and so obviously you can see how i mean people have used certain I mean, drugs, all sorts of methods, and they have gone crazy. They have sort of broken their brain in a way. And so I just want to stress to people, it's not at all that. This is more like how to adopt a different lens on reality. And the interesting thing is, I would also say an element of it is, is the ability to move between them and to know if one doesn't have efficacy and it doesn't work for you and you can move to another one. And I actually think that's why I say again, I don't feel like there's any downside. I don't think it feel like there's a way you could do this and then end up worse for wear. In fact, as I alluded to before, I think at a minimum, by adopting one of those lenses, you'll actually start to see other people and it'll actually remove the divide. You'll start to see why they see things that way. Or more importantly, as you say, you'll start to see like what what approach are they taking? What are their goals? Maybe you'll take out some of the, the window dressing that might have put you off otherwise. I think that's quite an interesting component of it. <laughs> Yes. And the purpose of a reframe is to go from an impoverished perspective on a topic to one of possibility, opportunity, progress, and productivity. And one usual frame, in fact, the first one of the book, 
is how frustrating it is to walk a dog. So Scott has a Scott has a dog, and a lot of people who can, can relate to the dog walking experience is the dog will just stop and sniff around, pee on a tree, you know, for example, and it's not really going anywhere. And you're just standing there frustrated, like, okay, come on, let's move, let's move yes. along, we're going to walk. And the usual frame is I'm taking my dog for a walk. But research into canine behaviors shows that when dogs go on a walk, what they're primarily doing is they're studying their environment and all the various scents, smells, and odors light up their brain almost the way uh, a very fun video game does for a human. Right. And they're exploring their world, they're mapping the territory, and it's great fun for the dog. And so the reframe, uh, the usual frame, now that you know this, the usual frame is, I'm taking my dog for a walk. Reframe, I'm taking my dog for a sniff. Right. And so the entire experience is different when you realize, oh, I'm not taking my dog for a walk to make them walk. I'm bringing them out so that they can do the canine equivalent of playing a fun video game that stimulates their brain. And it's a social experience because they get to find out what's going on in the neighborhood almost. And up and, and they can sniff out what other animals have been where recently and they can study their environment. And that's a really simple and kind of a fun one, but there are other reframes for other aspects of life. I'll give you one that I've experienced myself and I've, I've shared this on social media before and it resonates. And, he, and one of the posts I did got 1.1 million views on it. It was at the end of December last year. Um, the, so the usual frame is I can't change any of the big problems in the world. Reframe. Yeah. I can pick up litter. And so that simple premise that there's those big problems out there, well, I'm just this one little person. I can't affect any of that. Sure. But I can make my world around me a prettier place, a cleaner place. You know, a phrase we have in the States that's often used in politics is drain the swamp. And, I, and I've used this reframe. I can't drain the swamp, but I can clean it. <laughs> and so in my neighborhood, on my street, in my parks nearby, whenever I can, which is several times a week, I pick up trash. I pick up litter everywhere. I was on a 15 minute walk yesterday with my with my daughter. And as she was falling asleep for a little nap in the, in the baby carrier, um, I picked up two whole shopping bags worth of trash. That's something that I can do to make restoration of order be a priority. I can do something. And so I go from being impoverished and feeling weak to feeling strong and powerful and creating visual change that I and other people see. And by other people seeing that, I'm doing what I can at my level to make the, to make my world a better place. And I'm also setting an example for any motorists or pedestrians who see what I'm doing and feel inspired by that and go, wow, I, I can change something too. I don't have to wait for someone else to fix something. I have the power to change things too. As someone who himself is a hypnotist, one of the interesting things in our past discussion, I actually veered slightly into the topic actually of the occult. And I talked about the fact if anyone goes back and looks up the old Richard Bandler books and looks up even lots of the definitions of what magic is, it actually is literally about consciousness change and essentially it's techniques. I mean, famously, it's why I said go look up what his first books were called. And it's absolutely about language and about perspective and about like what essentially you believe. And so one thing I would ask you is this. It's obvious obvious that the world is full of people using these techniques knowingly or unknowingly maybe they're trained in school ad right ad copy and marketing skills etc everyone knows mad men type scenarios obviously there are literally people who are trained in these techniques and people don't know a lot of um politicians do nlp for example to become better at speeches or to know what to anchor a slogan or something so what i would ask you is this is in your particular case is part of this, do you feel like in the world you have, like you're describing in the, in the local aspect, but in your work that you put out into the world, do you have kind of a mission? Are you trying to persuade people into the world you want to see, into the into the things that you think are good? What What's your kind of raison d'etre to do this work? Yes, I am rather vanilla in most aspects of my life. And that said, the way of the vanilla does seem to be the way that provides ample opportunity for civilization to go on for 
law and order to exist. You know, I I have kids, married, family man, a, a, a ghost writing business, and I also author and create courses on writing and, and do other all, all, all manner of other things. And it's the stability of civilization which allows for those everyday experiences. Sure. Taking my kids down to the river and and you know finding a, a crayfish, you know, freshwater lobster. Or you know, catching fish in a little net, putting them in a bucket, and exploring that, and learning about the world. It's going to our creek in the backyard and finding a frog. It is playing golf with my son. You know, watch him get his first par. I mean, these are quote unquote boring activities. It's rather vanilla, my my lifestyle. But there are so many things that had to have come before us to provide a civilization which allows for the peaceful everyday prosperity we take for granted those little joys and little and little pleasures which are not possible in times of turmoil and upheaval where like um like uh jack's wife tani her her childhood was anarchy growing up in a former soviet republic it was total anarchy and and in poverty and nowadays any of us if we're hungry we can go get a snack but in those days you would have to go forage in the forest if you if you were hungry and needed a snack. Right. And maybe you wouldn't even get dinner. There there wasn't dinner available, and that wasn't even thirty years ago. That 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 this that this was a reality for people alive among us today. People who have little kids, and civilization is so precious, and it's like a good name. You know, they say it takes twenty years to build a good name, but it takes a matter of seconds to destroy it. Civilization has taken centuries to reach the point that it has, but it can take only a few months and years to eliminate it, to, to destroy it. And so I do what I can as a sort of a niche public figure. I'm not exactly a public figure. I'm a, kind of like a, a micro influencer sure. or a niche public figure. So I do what I can to advocate for policies and practices, both at a national level, a local level, and an individual level, things that further the safeguarding of civilization. Things like homeschooling, for example, I believe is, is essential because it allows for the deepening of the parent-child bond and the increased likelihood that those kids will go on to have kids of their own and that their parents and the kids are going to be involved in one another's lives. This was the problem that Mark, Karl Marx correctly pointed out of alienation, parents from children. Homeschooling is one of those practical solutions many parents, even lower middle class and underclass parents can do in the in many western countries uh to de-alienate themselves from their children to be part of one another's lives so that bond can exist for decades and then once the kid turn and, and rather rather than once the kid turns 18 they're kicked out of the house to go fend for themselves right, sure. but that bond can last for decades there can be grandchildren that they're involved with and great grandchildren and have this this larger family unit of aunts and uncles and and cousins and that's what allows for the maintenance and even the furthering of civilization and that's just one example plus cleaning up litter having a more beautiful place the more beauty in our natural world and the less destruction ruin the the more we want to be in nature the more we feel natural as opposed to cluttered and chaotic one thing from my own life and career that I found very interesting is that because I've done a lot of different things, I have my own YouTube channel, I've done journalism, et cetera. And sometimes I've done the equivalent of being sort of a sports analyst. It could be like on the NFL or the NBA, but it's obviously within the video game space, so a little bit smaller scale. But at the same time, people would probably be surprised. I've been on broadcast that had 2 million unique viewers watching it live. When you get into that kind of a scenario, it's actually made me realize why that classic quote that goes like something along the lines of like you can accomplish almost anything so long as you don't mind who gets the credit is so key. Because what I realized was it wasn't me getting the two million people watching in that scenario. At the same time, I'm part of it. So in a way, I, I could get a little bit of an ego boost at the same time, though I'd have to stay humble because obviously then if I didn't work on another event like that, I don't have access to that crowd anymore. And so I'm not the one doing it entirely. And I always found that's a very interesting dynamic because I can tell you a lot of my colleagues that were just in that space, they got lost in the source, mate. They thought they were the reason the two million were there. And some of them, like famous examples would be the biggest Twitch streamers in the world when Twitch is the biggest platform 
time and time again have taken enormous deals from rival launch platforms to go there. They get like millions of dollars and you can imagine they go, where's all the viewers? And it's like, they weren't actually there for you, mate. They were actually there. They were going on to Twitch in this analogy and they were looking who's the biggest, you're the biggest. So they tuned into you just the same as if I put on the TV, what's on, I watch the movie. But this is the equivalent of like, now they'd have to, the analogy in the TV would be, now it's like they have to send off to some weird postal thing to get the movie. They probably won't do it. You know what I mean? They probably won't hear about it. They won't hear you there. You're not in the medium. So I wondered in your case, as you say, you, you yourself have been a part of books, especially ones that you've ghostwritten that have reached millions of people. They've had enormous impact. In fact, they've even built and and uh, sustained the reputations of people who might not even know there's a ghost striking element. Just think these words come solely from the brain, as if from the, the mouth of the author to their ears, as it were, from the lips to the ears. So in your particular case, how do you balance that aspect out that on the one hand, you can have enormous effect over the world, but it mainly seems to be if you, I mean, now you're getting co-writing co credits, that's pretty good. But in the past, it was, you almost had to take it on the chin of like, I, I helped with a lot of that, but. I, and people are not going to know it was me and they won't know it's me till they meet me and they, they hear about it. And at the same time, is there a part of you ever thinks I just want to, I want to be the only author in the future. I'll one day stop being ghostwriting and I'd like to be a, a figure that was a large one. How do you balance that dynamic? I balance that, that dynamic with a bit of, uh, with a bit of a bookend, we'll say. So the, the first bookend is that my first foray into the literary world was with my own books, my own, my own novels. So my my debut books that I worked on were published under my own name. I got that book deal almost 12 years ago now. And I got that initial experience of having my name out there and being in the papers and being on television, uh, having a book launch back before book launches were a thing and being a little social media star and all of that. And then I felt like, you know, I want to help other people do this. For themselves too. And so it was something I had already already felt fulfilled in doing for myself. And I wanted to help other people create that experience. And then so for more than a decade, the primary thing I did was ghostwrite books for other people. Sometimes they mentioned me and thanked me. Sometimes they didn't. But it didn't matter because I knew what I was getting myself into. But now, as I help more and more influential people, and it's known that I was a collaborator on the book, more and more people are coming to me saying, Joshua, what are your tips? What, what's your advice? Right. And that's why I wrote my my first nonfiction book, which I, I'd never planned on doing. But enough people had been asking me to write a book on what it's like to write books for the famous and the rich and the successful. I thought, okay, fine, I guess I'll do it. And so it would rather than a, an ego boost, it was a a necessary chore uh, to produce okay. that book. And then this this work, this uh, collaboration with Jack uh, has been more of a, I see it more as a personal project for something I'm passionate about, which is the safeguarding of civilization so that my, my kids, my, my grandkids, so on and so forth can enjoy the simple pleasures of life that so many of us have that we take for granted and can be seized from us by forces of anti-civilization. And that seizure can happen in a matter of months and a few short years where everything changes and the good times are gone. And I want to do what I can professionally and personally to to save civilization. I'll leave it at that. I want to cheat at the end here and ask you essentially to impromptu you, reframe my brain and help me out a little bit. And I'm going to cheat in the sense that like, it's like if I brought a really good chef onto a TV show to talk about things. And at the end, I just said, can you cook up a little marinara sauce? Can I get a little taste at the end? So here's what I'm going to tell you, okay? In my sphere, I am someone where, even though it's nearly always, I'm just, I'm just tweeting my opinions about video game competitions, guys. I know you think it wouldn't be that serious. You'd think, you know, it's just, it's just nerds or whatever. And you have to understand it's life and death. Like people, like the, my joke has always been, if you rank the other guy's favorite player, the second greatest player of all time, you are the devil. You are, you hate him. You are there to antagonize this guy. You actually wrote that tweet just for him. Just so he'd see it and get incensed. And it means that you must hate that player. Like he probably slept with your mother. You know, you can see how people spiral from this. They go, it, their reaction is incredible. It's incredibly polarizing. But the problem I've always had and I've struggled with is this, Joshua, is in a way, that kind of attention, if you can harness it, is obviously very powerful. And in fact, one of the things in So Good They Call You a Fake is this notion that like a bad review from a bad person or someone that you don't want to align with your thing becomes a good review in the right eyes, right? So what I want to ask you is this. 
I actually haven't really thought on these levels about a lot of my career. I've just sort of reacted a lot of the time. So I'll tell you straight up, because I came from a world where I did see some of the grander things in culture where people were getting cancelled and people were like infiltrating your group and then they'd start seeing small things and then it'd get worse and they were sort of documenting what you were doing and then they were antagonizing you and suddenly you know, you were in a struggle session and suddenly all your friends are being asked, which side are they on? Are they gonna are they gonna support what you've tweeted it? And one of the things I noticed was my reaction is a very, very simplistic one. I just reduced all the noise by essentially, I just have this rule that goes like this. If someone is trying to seemingly harm my reputation and career, and I don't mean just say you're an idiot or you're bad at right. You know, I mean like they're saying like this person cannot be allowed to stay in this space. They're a bigot. And, and crucially, along those lines, as a corollary, I took the notion that if they say you're racist or you're sexist or you're whatever it might be, whatever ist and ism it is, I just block them. I've got to say it straight up. I block them and I ignore them. That's been my tactic so far. Sort of just turtle up, you know, and I just figure out my people will see my stuff. If I block them, if anything, I may be doing us both a favor, right? Maybe then they don't see my stuff anymore. They don't get triggered. Maybe they can just go off and do their own thing. I will say, I don't think it's actually as effective as I thought on their end. Like on my end, it works. I block them out. They don't get, I, I realize some of them even radicalize just publicly further. Man. If anything, they sort of discuss you like you become Voldemort. You just, you just become, you know, the lips on everyone. In fact, the fact that you've blocked them becomes a narrative itself and a way for them to identify. So what I would ask you is this. Am I doing it wrong, do you think? Do you th would, I, would it be more effective, for example, if I never blocked any of them? Would it actually be better for me to do almost like what that famous cartoonist Stone Toss does? He jokes that like his best marketers are these idiots that are taking his comics. Like, have you seen this comic? And then they're just spreading it among all their people. And then it would, should, would I be smarter to go that route? Am I maybe fearing like, you know, I mean, I mean look, I can't lie. I, I like I like um, fictional ideas. I like fantasy. I like to let my imagination go. I am sort of acting like they're going to have me to go like one day and they're going to be reading off the tweets. Like, did you tweet this on the twenty? Probably not. But what, what would your what would your advice be? What would you what would your reframe be for me on that topic? Because I feel like what I'm doing is just I've taken a very hard nosed approach. But I don't know it's that working that well. If you know what I mean. Especially yeah, there's two purposes. there's two ways to respond to the to the mob. There's one which is to uh, uh, just to utterly ignore them. We, by the way, um, this past week we saw a mass, we'll, we'll, we'll call it an e assassination, not an assassination, but, but an okay. e assassination. The, the, the digital taking out of the influencer in the health space, Andrew Huberman. Oh, sure. New yes. Yorker wrote this diatribe against him. It was all hearsay and gossip um, that was entirely inappropriate for the public to see. Andrew Huberman said absolutely nothing about it at all. He didn't even acknowledge it. It didn't even register as being important. There was no response. There's no apology. There was no, let me explain myself. He just went on doing his whole thing like it never even happened. That's one effective way because it kills off any energy or momentum. And then people who believe it, well, you, we're never going to buy from you anyway. Probably we're never fans and didn't even like you in the first place. Right. So you you lose nothing. So there's that strategy. And then there's this is what I like to do. This is what Stone Toss likes to do, which is to mock ruthlessly, incessantly. Ride the energy of the mob towards greater sales. And this is if you have something to sell. So Stone Toss, of course, he has his little plushy toy. Sure. I bought 10 of them. <laughs> when he when he was canceled, sure. I bought 10 of them as a show of support. Uh, because anytime the communists come for someone, and by the way, it was literally communists, oh, right. like actual okay. communist party members. Right. Active, active, act, act, like self-proclaimed communists uh, who, who uh, yeah, were coming after okay. Stone Toss. Um, <laughs> he just makes fun of them and says, "The more, the more hate you give me, the more people re I, I reach, and therefore the more product I sell." Right. I, I prefer that approach myself. And then the last thing is a similar one. It's a similar vein. It's basically a corollary, which is one of the reasons for my end that I thought this worked blocking people is. Then I thought, because I don't read their horrible comments, I won't then react because I will admit one of my biggest weaknesses is impulse control. Now, I've done a smart thing in my job, which is I'm sort of like, if you know the sports reference, I sort of do kind of a Skip Bayless type Stephen A. Smith approach. Essentially, I harness my rants and I harness the fact that I'm annoyed that someone else, the joke is I'm like the super fan, but it's not a nutter. I, I also think he's ranking that guy there. What is he talking? You know, I, I kind of harness the that that energy as it were. But the problem I noticed is, 
that comes across amazingly in real life and on camera because I understand also like how to use my hands to speak for me. I understand like uh, uh, when to do so, sort of a wink at the camera, you know, to show that he's being saucy there, isn't he? He doesn't really mean that. He's having fun. I, I will even laugh at my own jokes, even though that sounds obnoxious, but as a way to show the audience, it's a joke. Like even I'm sort of like, for example, even when I get in a big rant and then I'll suddenly laugh almost to clear the air, like oh, I've gone off on one there, you know? And I feel like that works so well in video and it works so well in real life, but but in text, it's terrible. In text, none of that comes across. And I notice that it becomes very easy, not just to misinterpret, but just to just hit you. Like, the, For example, the famous thing online, I would say is almost a rule, is if someone doesn't like you, nothing you ever said was a joke. You could literally say knock knock joke, bro, and they would. Say, it would be a dog whistle about you know. So, you know what I mean? You can you can never get it to be a joke. So can you give me one last reframe, which is this? How would I make it so that? At least in people who have good faith intentions, I can't I can't win over obviously evil people and maybe wouldn't want to. But the people in the middle, the ones that you worry about hearing these campaigns and these cancellations, how can I make being someone who rants and being someone who does get mad sometimes and being someone who, who can lash out, I can I can certainly be spicy. How do I make that come across how I manage how I'm able to do it in real life? How can I make it seem more fun or like I'm just having fun with it? What would you say? What would you say? What's a reframe I could have in that sense? You can allow them to give you the benefit of the doubt by sharing a few more personal details about yourself that are endearing throughout your, throughout okay. your social media, throughout your content about this or that family member that you've, that you've got that you do this with, or one of your favorite things about in, in nature. So like I have recurring posts that I, I, I share about what I do with my kids, about homeschooling activities, about going out in nature, cleaning up litter so that when I post something that's spicy, the moderates, the normies who read me know that I'm a family man who's actively involved with my right. kids. I homeschool and I clean up litter and I'm like, I love being out in nature. I'm a good guy. So they give me the benefit of the doubt. So if you do the same, sharing endearing personal details, occasionally peppering that throughout uh, about yourself, then you will too get moderates and normies giving you the benefit of the doubt with your spicy stuff as well. Perfect. Do you have anything at the end to say? I'll, I'll leave the floor to you for the final word. That there's not everything all of us can do to protect our civilization. Not each of us can do everything, but, but all of us can do something. Whatever that something is, even if it's going outside of your flat or your backyard or the front step, clean up the litter that's there, make your world and therefore the world a better, more beautiful and stable place for everyone. But first of all, for yourself, because you deserve to have a beautiful world, but only if you make it so. This video and the others on my channel were supported by the people on my side, my side channel, Patreon. Do you want to choose a topic I focus on next? Maybe ask a question in my regular video AMA. Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are for Thor Inquiry interviews. Do you want to take part in a never-to-be-released, exclusively recorded, one-hour discussion between me and you, which actually you could also use for consulting or some sort of coaching if you'd like? Well, if so, heed this call to action and join Thor inside today, where in the description box, there's a Patreon link.